Hi, it's Benjamin Douglas Ray with another edition of Sustainable Cannabis TV. Today I'm here with Jake Hammock. It's a very special um, show today, and I want to introduce you, Jake. He's the CEO of Silu Technologies. We've talked a little bit about it this week, but it's a super innovative technology. And I really wanted to spend time with you, Jake, so that you can explain this, because for me, it's completely revolutionary and innovative for not only the cannabis industry, but many others. How are you today? Doing wonderful, Ben. And thanks so much for having me on the show. How are you? Uh, I'm pretty well today. You know, it, it's Friday and Fridays are always good. And, you know, looking forward to the weekend. And now we've got a lot of nice weather. It's not cloudy here today. So always makes for a great weekend here in Colorado. Same, I suppose, with you in uh, in Utah. Yeah, a little bit cloud cover here outside. Looking out the window right now, we could use a little bit more snow, but kind of misty, dreary right now. So uh, the weekend's supposed to get a little warm, but uh, hopefully you'll get that weather back over this way on the side of the Rockies. There you go. Well, before we jump into it, I just like to tell the viewers and listeners that I am speaking and moderating the panel on the awards, sustainability awards at the Emerge Conference, which you can see in my post. Jump on there. You can buy some tickets for a reduced rate. And I'd love to have you be part of that show. That's next um, Tuesday at uh, 12 o'clock uh, Mountain Time. So, Jake, tell us about your history, where you're from, um, everything that got you up to where you are today. And then tell us a little bit about Cellular Technologies. And then I've got a lot of questions for you about the technology itself and other parts of your life. But now it's up to you. Go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, Ben, I'm originally from uh, the great state of Tennessee, and um, I, uh, I served in the, uh, the U.S. Army and the military for, uh, for over a decade. And throughout my, my journeys, I, um, I've noticed a world generally without water, food, strife, insurgencies, war, that kind of thing. And um, there's a way that we can, we can really do better uh, and give back uh, to our climate, to our world, to our environment, to our earth. Um, and stumbled upon uh, this technology with my partners, um, Orlin and Missy Wesker, uh, so that we could truly give back. And cannabis is a great conduit of how we can do that strictly through water, energy needs, and also the healing practices within it. Um, but additionally, I, um, I studied most of my undergraduate in, uh, in North Africa and then came back to Tennessee, uh, then back and forth all over the world again, through the army taking me from here to there and studying languages and a myriad of engineering principles, et cetera. Um, so my partners and I came together. Um, it was more of how can we, how can we either reverse engineer existing solutions or how can we engineer a new technology where we can produce water and power from one revolutionary new system? And, uh, and we did that. Uh, so we came together over a greenfield product um, to design, create, and we're currently now prototyping this, which I'm sure we'll talk mainly about. And then going into Salu, uh, which is what we what we spawned from this vision, um, Salu is the um, is the epitome. It's the uh, the company that we structured this product around in order to give back. And there's a really cool history about the name of Salu and why we chose it in the Native American um, theme on how to give back. Um, but anyways, where we are today, we're still rather early stage uh, for sure. But within our product design, development, and prototyping endeavors, we're very much so. Um, looking to make a, uh, a global impact and notably within the cannabis and medical hemp space. So when you were, you, you were just saying that, you know, you traveled all over the world and you saw a need based on, um, you know, water, clean water, things like that. So where, where all were you, where did you travel to where you, where this was most profound in terms of, you know, coming up with there needs to be a solution to this? Yeah, probably more North Africa. Um, so I studied in, uh, in Morocco and then Egypt um, specifically, but um, even being in Sub-Saharan Africa to see strife, uh, been on um, uh, multiple overseas uh, uh, deployments, missions, et cetera. Um, and Afghanistan was certainly an area that was affected by strife and war and insurgency um, and just see lands of desolation. Um, so think of this dystopian atmosphere or environment where um, either buildings are on fire or there's uh, a lack of food, a lack of crops. Um, uh, the soil has been uh, incredibly destructive based off of, of these war efforts. Um, and there's a way that we can give back. There's a way that we can still sequester carbon from the air um, in order to replenish the soil. There's still a means that we can use natural resources of the earth 
that we can produce water and within that water we can produce crops etc and so it was it was just being with me for for years uh, and seeing these uh, these dystopian landscapes that there now is a probability um, and, and certainly with us that we can now transform these areas over time into more utopian landscapes than what we see now like the, the beautiful sunny day in denver that can be a global phenomenon if we allow it to be, well, relatively speaking, Antarctica may be a stretch, but other than that, <laughs> it should be more of utopian to create. So it was something that you, through your travels, you would see land and you just have this feeling in you that there has to be a better way. And that had been kind of boiling for a long time until you were able to, you said kind of stumbled on the technology, but I imagine you had a, a, a vision of, of, we've got to solve this problem. And that's really kind of what sparked the the innovation here. It seems like that's it. Yeah, it's the there. Without sound, sounding like a retro commercial, there there is means that we already have around us to spawn and manifest something new. Mm-hmm. Whether it be from the technology, whether it would be from a, an individual product, whether it be a yield or output from that product, or an environmental service for science. Um, and another uh, uh, pinpoint here is that I also uh, was in the hacking space for many years. So hacking computational systems and working for the government to do just that. And then how can we um, uh, look at existing technologies, either hack them or decouple them or take them apart? And then how can we give back? How can we just use um, these existing technologies if we either decouple them, transform them, um, do something to them so that we know the yields over here, we have a, a technology that's been around for over 100, 200 years. Let's just see if we can merge four or five or six or seven or eight of these technologies together to create the intended output to give back to the earth. So right, right. along with that, it was more of this hacking mindset that came together with my partners of the Weskers uh, to say, um, there is a means that we can now transform both existing technologies and transform even innovation that we've created at Salu into one universal system, to one universal application. And so more of a hacking mindset, coupled with a vision, coupled with compassion, coupled with, we know we can do it. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of that entrepreneurial spirit is that you're not gonna say no you know, yeah. <laughs> to yourself. You're gonna, you're gonna find a way to solve this problem. And, and that's really how, you know, all great companies are, you know, I think successful or all companies are successful. If you have just a great idea, but you're solving problems, big problems. Yep. Yep. You got it. Um, it is not necessarily taking no for an answer or not taking no for an answer. It's that, uh, well, if we can't do this, well, I know we can do this. And then over time, the celestial body is to start to, um, to aggregate into one, um, either to one nebulous or to one center of mass that we can then say, this is how we solve it now uh, without the world saying it can't be done, it can't be done, it can't be done. You're absolutely right. It's the entrepreneurial spirit that just um, envelops us. And um, you know, another great name I love, love to mention that would bring that spirit into us is a gentleman by the name of Tom Strauss, who Tom really just energized that spirit and brought it here. He knows how to be a founder. He knows how to can gel teams together. And when we all came together as this one team, the celestial spirit just said, yep, we're going to solve it. And here's how we're going to do it. <laughs> yeah, Tom's got great energy. He just, yeah, yeah. He does. It's uh, infectious for sure. I mean, the energy to keep us going on this train is, uh, um, is miraculous. It's nothing short of miraculous. And Tom brought that to us. <laughs> I'll do a shout out to Tom Strauss. I know he's watching the show. So, yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit about energy and CO2. You know, we, we've had some shows on here where we're talking about, you know, CO2 capture and really, you know, within cannabis, energy consumption is a, is a big deal. So, can you talk about your technology in terms of sustainability related to CO2 and, and energy use? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'll start with the energy side and kind of bifurcate them and break them down into two different areas real quick. Um, and, and starting with the energy component, as you're well aware, Ben, cannabis is an energy hungry crop, energy hungry plant. Um, and growing cannabis sustainably is uh, an incredibly a dire task in order to conserve energy, um, both economically and environmentally. Um, which has plagued the industry almost. Uh, last year, uh, there was approximately six billion spent um, just within the cannabis space in the U.S. 
Mm -hmm. uh, which for comparison, that rivals all the federal government buildings in the U.S. <laughs> so, really? um, wow. yeah, it was a really interesting find to see that it was a, a federal, all the federal buildings in the U.S. Uh, compared to that of the cannabis industry, it was almost a one to one correlation of six billion dollars spent wow. just within energy. Um, and then looking, you know, even what uh, on how cannabis is cultivated generally between greenhouse and indoor growing environments. Um, you know, it really comes down to HVAC and lighting, you know, greenhouses, you generally have more natural lighting from the sun, um, uh, and in indoor growing environments, you need, um, um, either high powered LEDs or LEDs that emit heat in order to get that Goldilocks zone of 75 degrees to 85 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, with generally low humidity being involved. And so where our technology comes in is that we use a combustible fuel source that's generally already available today in the U S. Um, so we think most common of natural gas um, or propane, they're generally most widely abundant. Um, and we also can use um, hydrogen uh, when it's burned or methane, which is certainly the, uh, the Goldilocks window for us in our trajectory uh, in that we can do a complete waste to energy conversion within the technology, or we can certainly use geothermal. Um, and there are some small applications of concentrated solar, but that's generally more of a high capex expenditure. And so using already available gases, um, we know that the one of the most efficient ways to produce power is through heat, heat conversion. Um, and so looking at a co-heat and power generation application just within our technology, we can then convert the heat from natural gas, propane, hydrogen, methane, et cetera, into available power as opposed to solely using it for heat. And then our system can then trap that heat, if you will, for lack of a better term, and then conserve that heat and then heat and cool our environments at the same time. So as opposed to using natural gas or propane solely for heating an indoor growing environment or a greenhouse, we can use that to produce energy, but also to regulate HVAC, mm. which is a pretty wild phenomenon when it comes to energy costs solely in the U.S. Um, and then something on, um, on CO2 to kind of move over here a little bit. Um, CO2 is a very um, uh, brilliant subject that's now being studied. Uh, and there's several articles being published in Science and Nature recently. Uh, Colorado State University just made several publications a few weeks ago, actually within this the space in CO2, of how to, um, what are the measurement rates of CO2 sequestration within cannabis plants um, compared to that of what CO2 is being fertilized in the environment. So we can extract CO2 from the same combustible fuel line system in order to CO2 fertilize these environments, sequester that CO2 back into the soil while the plants transpire available water and oxygen back into the atmosphere. So the more growers that we have, they economically will consume um, less energy from in terms of price, same energy for kilowatt hours in use, but less price for that mm -hmm. using one available fuel source and oh, and by the way, receive other climate controlling services with our product using one system. Wow, that, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's good stuff. As I said, it's it's pretty revolutionary. You you just mentioned about uh, greenhouse or grows. What? How can your technology uh, achieve sustainability within you know greenhouses and or or versus you know um, you know outdoor uh, outdoor grows? Yeah. Very challenging question between the, the sustainability cultivation versus, you know, that sort of regenerative cultivation. Um, and, and both are absolutely on the right track so that we can take care of the earth while still proving an economic advantage for that of our cannabis cultivators and growers. Um, on the indoor growing side, and I'll speak, you know, greenhouse uh, primarily right now, is that we, we use less energy for greenhouses, more than indoor growing environments. Um, uh, generally, we're using an average rate of around 520 kilowatt hours um, per kilogram of produced product of cannabis, just with greenhouses. Now, compare that to indoor growing environments, we're using around um, approximately 5,000 kilowatt hours per kilogram. Mm -hmm. Massive difference between 520 to 5,000, and that's solely because of what energy is being produced in order to climate control these environments. Um, indoor growing, you require much more intensity of LEDs and HVAC units to then conduct air exchange to get the right Goldilocks zone of humidity and cooling right within one, uh, one plant or one cubic area of a plug plant uh, for your growth. In greenhouses, you generally don't have that same problem when it comes to lighting, though you still have it with HVAC. So our technology actually contributes economically and environmentally to both. 
Hmm. Um, and what I mean by that is that we no longer just need natural gas or um, or propane, even for that matter, even a water main line or an electrical distribution line that is now creating low constraints from the grid. Um, so we all know that our, that our grid uh, could have a lot of repair work done to it. Um, most days we're very fortunate to have continuous power, but we do have some days, you know, I'm here in Utah, we have a snowstorm and our power most likely will go out. <laughs> um, and how can we conserve power for the grid so that we can maintain other power available supplies to other residential or commercial infrastructure? Uh, it's a very hard challenge. Uh, wind has been trying to solve this for a while in turbine technology. Um, solar has been trying to solve this um, in addition to uh, wind technology. Geothermal is another advancement of this. These renewable resources on how we can conserve grid power strictly from fossil fuel providers, uh, let alone our substation infrastructure. And so going into not just the economics per se, but more on the environmental side for a moment, um, in both greenhouses and we're growing environments for cannabis as it relates to sustainability, our technology is off grid. Um, we do not require that of a distribution line uh, from a utility operator ran to the facility. We do not require a water main line for that matter ran to the facility. As our technology, our system, even though it's in the prototype stages now, we will be able to produce on site power and water for the available cannabis grower right there on site. And generally more than what they would need so that we can then um, sell and not only sell that power back, but provide that power back for our grid operators to maintain even higher grid resiliency and step up and step down substations. So what do, what do you see in different states? How would that work in terms of different state regulations and, and for yeah. that matter, different counties or, or even different countries? How do you see the challenges in there or, or you know, how would that work? I actually see more opportunities, Ben, and, and challenges with this, uh, knowing with what, we, what we've researched, what we, who we've talked to, who we've partnered with already. Um, and I'll give an example of, um, that's probably no secret in the industry, of energy reporting requirements through state regulators. Um, I was reading uh, very recently on the Cannabis Control Commission from the state of Massachusetts on how much available power um, must uh, not be exceeded within one, um, one cubic fit, foot of cannabis. I'm sorry, one square foot of cannabis growth. One square foot of cannabis growth is anywhere between 36 and 50 watts of power. And that is max, that's it. Mm -hmm. uh, or else you're in violation of the Cannabis Control Commission State Code of Massachusetts. Um, the state of Illinois, they have a reporting requirement every year. Most states and counties are, are now doing this um, in order to report how much energy are you using and how much water are you using per square foot, uh, cubic meter, square meter um, uh, of plants in your crop cycle and your growth in order to conserve energy. And so for the cannabis space and for our cultivators, for our growers, for our investors, we now can say, well, we're not taking that power from the grid anymore. These regulations are primarily from grid power saturation, grid power consumption. You're now taking this from an off-grid system. So it would be no different than if a generator was supplying power continuously, yet you're not straining the grid nearby to you, which is a, it's a beautiful phenomenon in order to provide power back still maintain your reporting requirements for kilowatt hours being produced for HVAC, for lighting, for irrigation pumps, uh, for CO2, uh, CO2 fertilizers, et cetera. Um, but when it comes to grid available power, none, unless you chose to actually have an inverter there to use grid available power, which we still would recommend. But when it comes to regulations, that is the absolute paramount idea that we partner with these cannabis providers. We partner with these state industry regulators to say that we were using our technology off grid producing this power still within your thresholds. And oh, and by the way, we're producing more power back to the grid in order to service available markets, customers, markets, et cetera, within your state. So it's a win-win for everyone. So, you, so you're saying you don't, even need, uh, you don't even need to be hooked up to the water line or even a well, you can just create water basically. Yeah, yeah. And um, generally what happens, you know, when you walk into a, um, um, uh, say a cannabis grow facility, uh, more in the greenhouse side, indoor growing sides generally have more climate control infrastructure, but in the greenhouse you walk in and more times than not, you're just immediately confronted with humidity. Um, and the, um, the term that everyone's trying in the space in order to hit the right Goldilocks zone is the vapor pressure uh, deficit. Um, how can we maintain the absolute precise humidity from ambient to the available humidity within the leaf and compare those two? 
And so what we do is say, well, let's reclaim this humidity from the atmosphere and recycle that water back into the soil. Um, so as opposed to just flushing the humidity out, because we know that too high humidity concentrates in ambient air will create mold and mildew and, and generally lead to crop loss inevitably. Um, and too, um, too low of humidity will create higher transpiration rates so the plant's not um, intaking the water that it needs and storing it within the somatic cells of the leaf. Um, so there's this Goldilocks window of how to have the right humidity and pressure in these environments. In our system, what we do is reclaim the humidity from the atmosphere, uh, recycle that water back into crop growth without any need for a water well or water main line for access. Um, and generally more times than not, depending on the infrastructure and space and plants, et cetera, with plants being over 90% in the cannabis world, uh, over 90% transpiration rate, meaning that if you were to um, water one cannabis plant with 100 gallons of water, it's going to sweat back out into the atmosphere 90 gallons of that water. Hmm. Um, we can then recycle that back into the soil. It's generally more than what our what our market would need in order to maintain a sustainability growth window. So that's going to work in, let's say, Colorado or in North Africa. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and we also love, uh, you know, generally more um, colder environments for us is, is where we have more of an applicability just because that we can serve so much heat in our technology. But within indoor growing environments, our system climate controls the entire environment. Hmm. Uh, and by doing that, by the way, uh, of, of comparing that of uh, water generation from the humidity that we reclaim from the atmosphere to that of air exchange from an HVAC unit, which we conduct air exchange and movement um, of around 13 to 1500 cubic feet per minute for uh, what we've designed so far and that we are building um, in our roadmap, we can then regulate the humidity and temperature. So not only do we produce power and water, but humidity control and temperature control from one system at a more economic advent, at, um, advantage for almost any geographic climate. Um, so it's indoor, we can climate control it. So in North Africa, for example, right? Desert, arid landscapes, parts of Utah here, very desert, arid landscapes, um, which we're now really embracing the medical hemp community here uh, in this state. Um, we can now be able to climate control these environments. And also with the more that we plant, the more that we produce uh, by default, more carbon sequestration that occurs, more oxygen that is produced back into the atmosphere and more water that can be produced back into the atmosphere. So we, we can become more geographic agnostic as to how we use this technology across the globe. Well, it sounds like magic, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Some days we wish it was. <laughs> so, uh, no, I assure you, it's actually been uh, based off of uh, a known thermodynamics principle within heat exchange and transfer and the known physics principle um, of water generation. So we really took an atmospheric science approach, um, an atmospheric engineering approach within how we combined coheat and power generation with that of dehumidification, atmospheric water generation and electrical generation. And we stumbled across based off the, uh, the engineering design, the challenges that we ran into, the obstacles, the discoveries, um, one of which was um, CO2 fertilization. And we can extract CO2 um, simply because uh, most combustible uh, fuel gases here in the U.S., they have um, sulfur. And we can use sulfur to actually create um, a CO2 strictly from the derivative of the combustible gas system. So it's really a crazy phenomenon that we've been able to discover all of these attributions and we were able to combine them and we currently are again, in the prototyping phase into one universal system. That's great. You know, my camera keeps going off, but I can still hear you and everything. So just keep talking. So viewers and listeners, that's that's what's happening there. Well, it's uh, it's a great system, super innovative and, and revolutionary. I want to talk a little bit about just practical use. Like, so growers uh, could really use this to kickstart their operations and climate control systems uh, more effectively. Can you talk about that practically, how that would work? Yeah, yeah. And that's actually a, one of our missions. Uh, we have many missions, but our, our main vision that we have in Salu is to create sustainable and regenerative communities um, across the globe. Uh, we can have food now produced closer to consumers. We can have medicinal use crops such as cannabis being produced closer to consumers. Uh, without importing for either overseas or from different continents, et cetera, they are now here. And so part of that is the upfront cost, you know, to start an indoor growing facility or even a greenhouse for that matter, 
Um, some of the very first questions that will be asked are, you know, if I was doing this, what are my utility costs? What will they be uh, month to month or annual between water, uh, power, um, CO2, how can I climate control the environment, et cetera? So a recurring expense in climate controlling. Am I building my infrastructure near an urban epicenter? Am I building it rural? Do we even have access to power or water? Um, uh, some areas in Utah do not have that. A lot of areas here don't, in Colorado, very similar to the West. Um, and even that, it's more expensive when you do have it. So, you know, running a, um, a water main line may cost anywhere between twenty and $200,000, depending on how far you are uh, from your nearest uh, water main infrastructure um, and your aquifer infrastructure. And so all these questions then become um, uh, cyclic. They become um, that of discouraging that it is far too high in cost. Uh, and then I have to think of my CapEx. What are my hardware expenses for a dehumidifier? Do I need to have a generator for on-site power backup? As, let's be honest, if your power fails, your industry's done. If your power fails for even a day, it could cause catastrophic results of loss of plant crop and life. Mm -hmm. um, within humidity, within energy, HVAC, et cetera, there's only so many ways around that we can do that. So generators are really going to be needed. Um, are there is a need for CO2? Uh, cannabis thrives very well within a 900 to 1200 parts per million of CO2 in the air. Um, generally around you in, in the air from an environmental perspective here, we have around 300 to 400 parts per million of CO2 in the air, um, e.g. global warming in our phenomenon that's occurring with CO2 emissions back into the atmosphere. But cannabis thrived in early in a 900 to 1200 uh, ppm environment. Hmm. But talk about how I'm going to fertilize my cannabis crops now. And, and all of these um, uh, devices, they fight each other. Hmm. And so that would be the next question for me is that if I had a dehumidifier attempting to regulate the humidity within my indoor growing facility, my greenhouse, et cetera, um, it's constantly just dehumidifying water all the time. And it's using energy to do that. It does not care at all what your thermostat is saying on the wall, what your HVAC is doing, what your CO2 fertilizers are doing, which, oh, and by the way, raise the temperature <laughs> of the environment. So your dehumidifiers are just working nonstop, nonstop, continuously drawing even more power. Your HVAC unit um, that you would have conducting air exchange and regulating your temperature, it has one job to regulate temperature and go on and off, on and off, on and off. And generally that is energy exhaustive, even um, so much more in some studies than your lighting and your LED lighting. Lights will increase heat, et cetera. So you see all these devices that never work together, um, that it is painful to manage depending on your space and how much you're planting, your area of crop growth, et cetera. Um, water is another one. How much water that we, um, uh, that we even pay for either from wells or from water rights, et cetera, or licensing, um, or even having it delivered in trucks. Um, are we recycling that water? Is it just being lost back in the atmosphere and we're recovering it through another shipment um, of a truckload or we've turning it on? And if we have a drought condition, which by the way, in Utah, uh, Governor Cox just announced that last week that we have a state of emergency, which we do, uh, this becomes a problem, uh, a massive problem to start a cannabis growing facility. So with us, we eliminate all these CapEx barriers. Um, there is no need now by partnering with us to have a dehumidifier or an atmospheric water generator. There's no need now to have a CO2 fertilizer. There's no need to have an electrical generator. There's no need to have a very costly and high expense, 60 to $80,000 HVAC unit. We have one system, one system to remove the CapEx barriers. And then from there, we allow all the utilities to then service uh, these indoor growing environments, these greenhouses, um, to a degree, even some outdoor growing environments to fully climate control this infrastructure. Um, so it benefits um, our customers, our cannabis growers significantly, which is what we want um, to benefit. They're not paying any more between, uh, you know, five thousand, ten thousand, uh, fifteen, thirty thousand dollar a month in utility expenses that really eat into their cost. Looking at per kilogram or per pound of product uh, that has been sold, so it's a win-win economically, but um, also more importantly, environmentally. So if you were a company and you, you were going to onboard them, would you say it's better to have something up and running that you kind of um, augment or would it be or supplement or would it be just startups? What What's the best way? Can you talk about that with a, a, a newer existing company? Yeah, we can do both. Uh, I mean, certainly the, the, the starting element would be um, generally the, the easier path if you're building new infrastructure. 
uh, with our technology. Uh, I mean, we just talked about the elimination of all the capex and hardware expenses, et cetera, to do that. So it's generally more economically advantageous to do that. Um, but if we're talking even retrofit into existing large scale operations, um, what we would do in terms of onboarding is I would like to see your utility expenses. I would like to see what you're investing month to month or annually in climate controlling your environment, how much crop loss is occurring because of the deficiencies in your existing infrastructure. Um, and let's see what our system can do and, mm -hmm. and really invest where we can produce then water power, not stress loads within the grid. You have ease of reporting through regulatory industry reporting back through your states and your counties, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's a win-win either way we look at this between retrofit markets or that uh, new customer onboarding and new infrastructure, et cetera. Um, so we'll just look at the utility, climate control devices, how much economics are, are being invested into this from a capitalization expense and operation expenses. Um, and then from there, competitively price um, what you're, they're paying now within a climate control as a service model, um, then back to our customer in our market. So everyone can benefit. So, so if you were, um, you know, if you were a, a grower um, or involved somewhere in, you know, either lighting or heating, HVAC, and instead of just answering the question, how much does it cost? And you say way too much to say, actually share the data with you and you can look at it and say, here's where we could save you some money. Yeah, right? you got it. You got it. hundred percent. I'd love to see the data and let's make an objective decision together. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to, you know, saying that it's magic and we're going to solve this problems. But our um, our goal within not only saving um, within climate control expenses for our customers and our market, it's also to increase crop growth. And so we want to look and partner with every one of our customers. How many plants did you lose last year? Um, uh, how, how do you think that you lost them? Mm -hmm. I want to partner with you so that we can understand if it was climate control related based off of whatever infrastructure and configurations that you have, how can we then say we're going to do better than that? Uh, mm -hmm. If we can hit these targets in these Goldilocks zones, let's say CO2, 900, 1200 uh, parts per million in the atmosphere or temperature between 75 and 85 or humidity being X, Y and Z, um, uh, et cetera, the energy being invested into this in order to get the right Goldilocks zone we want to increase crop yield. Uh, so not only do we want to um, uh, really expand um, our margins for our customers and selling their products and growth, because we know there's an environmental impact within carbon sequestration, which we love <laughs> as our company and our ethos. Right. We also want to create more crops for our customers. Uh, in addition to that, give them an ability to, to slightly scale on their existing infrastructure with you know, more crops being saved, more crops being produced, but also we can give them the ability later on, if you would like to start another facility, could we mm. do that with you? Which is exactly what we want to do is we're most likely going to be producing more power than what one infrastructure would need. Let's then see if we can create another growth facility. Why not? Well, it's uh, it's, it's great stuff. It's super, uh, I don't know, it's inspirational, you know? So, well, I wanna, I wanna change it up a little bit here. And I wanna talk to you kind of about your um, passions around cannabis because um, you know, you can have a great technology, but obviously, if you believe in this plant as a as a path to healing, you're going to be more successful because you're going to be all in. It's not just because the technology is cool, but actually because you believe in the plant. So could you talk a bit about your history and why you believe so much in this plant as a as a path to healing, as well as why it's a passion of yours? Yeah, and would, and would love to. Uh, and this is. This is really where, um, how do I even describe to start off the healing properties of the plant? So many studies and I could certainly not even compete with in my own research. Um, for me, I am a combat veteran um, and seeing combat at an early age, seeing combat uh, really throughout my, my early adult life, um, it can certainly create stress, anxiety, et cetera. Um, and, to, to not only see and, and hear what my colleagues have said about the, uh, the plant-based medicine of cannabis, of relieving this calming effect within PTSD, et cetera, um, but also getting your life back together. Um, and I can personally attest that's exactly what happened to me. And it is, it is wondrous that the uh, plant-based medicine within cannabis there's, there's, there's no secret why we have our indigenous cultures that have used this for centuries. 
um, and have wrote about it, have sang songs about it, have given them actual spirit names through um, the plants themselves that can be a part of that of soul. I mean, there's, there are thousands of pages of literature from indigenous cultures. Um, you know, one uh, from Latin America is Santa Maria, right? It's no secret. Um, and the conquistadors came uh, and there was a, a naming convention change between we call the St. Mary, what's morphed into Santa Maria, that of the spirit blending with that of soul in order to provide this uplifting spirit or relaxing spirit, whatever it is that you can receive this calming effect that the plant can then provide a healing property medicinally to you that pharmacology just cannot keep up with. Um, and so medicines of the earth are a very passion of mine uh, when it comes you know, personally, when it comes to what we can see, what we can do, what we can feel and how we get our lives back. Um, it, it's much uh, more amenable for me to, to tell you now, I would rather see the world that uh, that is plagued by anxiety from whatever reason, political fronts or um, what's happening right now in our existing country or global affairs. Um, I would rather see people heal from plant based medicines than that of opioids. You know, that we have if we have a binary choice, let's do, let's use what's from the earth already. And we have a track history of it working. <laughs> so, right. um, you know, it's just a personal passion of mine and it grown sustainably is even better. Uh, not only do we win on the recovery ability of the plant, we now have an opportunity to give it back to the earth and our healing properties to heal these plants for growth. So I look at it as a beautiful dance uh, between the plant can heal us and we can also heal the plant. <laughs> And we've we've had a uh, past couple of days we have had some really good discussions about cannabis and healing and could you talk a bit about getting your life back you mentioned that twice here in the past couple of minutes can you talk about that really where you were and what happened through the cannabis use to to get your life back yeah um so uh, very good question by the way very deep question and i'd love to share part of my story it is for me, um, compounding stress uh, within within the world, I believe that we're all accustomed to it. I, I compounded stress in my life uh, within either things that I've, that I've seen at an early age, um, not having the ability to communicate those things with others. I mean, I, it's hard, you know, as a 20 year old kid to communicate these things that, that you've seen um, and even older. Um, and so, not necessarily the, the anxiety front for me, but it was more of how can I, what is my outlet? What is my outlet? And mm -hmm. there's very limited resources that I could, that I could speak to you about um, what I've experienced. Um, and I'm just going to say war, just to put it all in one bucket, if you will. But, you know, insurgency, strive, when I've observed individuals that were starving and near death uh, because of either malnutrition or lack of water. I've seen this commonly, um, individuals in Africa that um, are drinking infected water or have no access to water. Mm. And you know, it's gone. And, and, and we here in the States, we enjoy all these, these, um, um, uh, these resources of the earth in abundance. So I, I really had a hard time processing this. And then my, my journey to cannabis was outside of just throwing myself in quantitative research, which I did that for a few years, um, I need to, to, to be restful. I need to now rest and communicate that not just things are okay, but getting my life back in order of having clarity, receiving clarity just for me. And cannabis was a way to do that. Um, sativa blends were great for me. I mean, there's indica blends that can certainly put more in a relaxful state. Um, which did that for me. I'm not really one to, uh, you know, coffee does more of the, the jitters for me, but <laughs> uh, it was receiving clarity. And when I say clarity, I also mean balance, just work-life balance. Um, with that, uh, outside of throwing myself, you know, on the entrepreneurial roller coaster and research and research and research, but just now having a time to relax um, and be thankful to plant more, uh, which was, I personally love doing. Um, so it's just, um, for me, it was a beautiful winding road on cannabis that allowed me to then not only receive clarity, but to accept balance in my life. Um, so I'm able for the plan to do that. And I feel great about it. <laughs> the, um, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine this morning and we were talking really um, what we have here, you know, when you were talking a little bit about gratitude, that when you travel around the world and you see people that are, you know, in, in consistent strife or if there's you know, barren lands and, and starvation, 
you know, realize that we're really in the top, you know, be better off than 95 percent of the world, you know, here in the United States. And it's it's interesting to think about that. So when you travel, I imagine if you did that for 10 or more years where you're you're going back and forth between, you know, have have not abundance lack, it does start to, you know, really become confusing about, you know, what is my place here and what are what are we doing? And then through this technology that you found and kind of finding purpose, I can see how, you know, something that helps you find clarity uh, and and helps you really balance that out and find justification for your place in the world is is needing for a lot of people and very beneficial. And if you can do that through a healing natural plant, all the better. 100%. Yeah. That, what do you have to lose? <laughs> so, I mean, the, the risk of, of you losing um, within a non-addictive um, compound within the plant and healing properties that allow you to maintain, yeah, that purpose, that meaning, that sense of being uh, within all elements of creation. And, and I'm not necessarily here to, to say that it's a silver bullet by any means, but for me, it really was a kickstart catalyst of lighting a fire at that. Yeah, you can be grounded. Yeah, there is purpose. Yeah, there is balance. Yeah, and there's a way that I don't have to be the only one to enjoy this. Uh, right. Everyone can. And why not? Um, all, and I think you said it best. If it comes from a natural plant of the earth, and it's you know, all the better. Um, why would we not want to at least per, not only perceive, but welcome that um, into industry, into healing centers and practices? So that's my belief as well. I, I think it's a beautiful conversation. You know, I had a, a guy on the show, uh, Eric, a couple of weeks ago, and he's a, he's a vet and he makes rosin. He has a rosin company. And, uh, you know, I was just wondering for other vets out there that are, that are dealing with the challenge of of war, do you recommend any strains to deal with PTSD or things that you have experienced that would that you would recommend or that work for you? Yeah, uh, and for foremost, yes, <laughs> that's what I would recommend. Um, uh, the strain that I've been working with uh, is uh, forgive me, is it Jack Harar? Um, uh, I just want to make sure that yeah, that's the strain that on the sativa side that I've really been um, uh, embodying lately. And something that I do within some spiritual practices, uh, you know, it's, we all talk about set and setting and setting being a very crucial item uh, for the recreational use or for that spiritual application. Um, for me, it becomes that a spiritual application. And there are certain even visualizations you can look at um, and then create lessons uh, from each visualization that cannabis can then allow you to have healing and forgiveness. Um, and I'll be the first one to tell you I've reached levels of forgiveness through plant, this plant-based medicine um, that I never thought I could achieve. Mm -hmm. I never thought I could achieve, and it was wonderful. So I would absolutely recommend that vets out there listening, um, you know, if you're, if you never had, or you're interested, um, and, and again, it's not a silver bullet, but to give it a shot and that to sit with yourself, to be with yourself or, or others, you know, and um, try a strain that really works for you. But for me, um, sativa is what really, really recommends on the, for me on that strain, but indica is a great relaxing blend. Um, and there are um, hundreds, <laughs> there's probably too many for me to name. Um, so my, my vote is absolutely yes for combat. That's that there now could be another healing modality, a healing pathway and practice that uh, can allow you to maintain peace in your life. Um, it's no easy task. Um, it's You don't have to say a word. You don't have to talk unless you want to. Um, you may feel compelled to do that, um, but there's no requirement or there's no script. There's no um, uh, you know structure that in order for you to consume cannabis, either uh, be di digesting or smoking, et cetera, just be with you um, and then let that flow with where it takes you. And if you reach forgiving, if you reach clarity, if you reach balance, I mean, wow, what, what do you have to lose? Right. You know, I think one of the one of the things about forgiveness in many situations is starting with yourself. And I think that that, yeah. that is a healing element for cannabis. A lot of people say that it's a good place to 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 be with yourself and, and let yourself off the hook and then you can move forward with others. So 100 percent agree. And that was what I had to break down in my very first personal example. I had to forgive myself and then. Then the forgiveness train really took off from the station and then forgive this person, forgive this person. And, oh, you know, and, oh, we created all these challenges for ourselves and they're all learning opportunities. And so all the stress that came into our lives, we were born into that. And 
um, it was just a beautiful dance with life, uh, making these realizations, but cannabis really unlocked that door to say, Oh, this is, here we go. This is, this is where the train station is. Let's put some fuel in this bad boy and take off. <laughs> That's good. Well, well, great. Well, thanks for that insight. It's, it's valuable, you know, not, not just the technology, but also the people behind the technology. So I would like to jump into the last question here, and this is really about kind of investment and partners and yeah. companies you're working with. So in terms of your technology, you said this was kind of in, in beta, you're kind of pre, it's not commercially available. You can't go into a website and purchase it. So if you could talk about really the status of where you are kind of in the overall offering and your company, um, kind of the timeline and status, and then I'll kind of go from there, but, but where are you with this technology? Yeah. Um, so in terms of our, our phase of growth in the tech, we're currently prototyping our very first systems now. Uh, so we're very much so early stage. We're, we're very, very excited to announce that we'll be working with a hydroponics facility here in Utah um, very soon. So we um, uh, have partnered with a, um, a facility. Can't say the name of that facility just yet, but um, we, where we can actually use our prototyping systems within their infrastructure. Um, and our production model units will be available right now, we're saying early 2022. So we're targeting Q1 2022 when we hit full production of our design models so that we can then start servicing more um, grow facilities, large scale grow facilities um, um, across the U.S. Um, and in terms of you know, our investments right now, we are currently raising. Um, we are venture backed, uh, which is wonderful through a venture capital group here in, in Utah. But we are still currently raising uh, right now, and we're looking uh, for approximately um, uh, $10 million is where we're currently raising for. So we would love to partner with cannabis industries. And when I say partner with, there's a myriad of different ways we could partner with cannabis industries to do that. Um, but even a, um, uh, let's say, a growing facility um, in Colorado and, and um, in Nevada and California, et cetera, um, Oregon, uh, we could we'd absolutely be willing to look at either equity position placements or joint development agreements um, or even um, you know, licensing opportunities just so that our investments or investments into the company of Salu, we can then start manufacturing these systems, start servicing immediately their grow facilities, um, eliminating that barrier of utility cost saturation and improving their margin of growth per product. So this is exactly what we're looking for now. We're certainly in early stage. Uh, we're going to keep highlighting that. Um, but we have enormous potential for growth now that we have our the first hydroponic facility that we're going to be working with with a live prototype placement in the facility uh, to ensure healthy growing operations. Um, but we're also looking for investments from either angel investors um, in the space that are very passionate about cannabis, uh, which there are several out there and, and uh, would love to be a part of them one day myself. Uh, uh, family offices or venture capitalist groups that are looking within their portfolio companies, if they've invested in the cannabis groups, uh, we can then look at how truly we can save uh, their portfolio companies operating margins by eliminating that very high um, utility barrier, mm. um, which would improve, uh, improve their overall margins for future liquidation events. So we're very much so interested in finding the right financial partner uh, within our vision, shares our ethos, uh, love what we're doing. Um, they can truly really take us to the next level. So when you talk about partners, there, there are numerous kinds. It could be financial, it could be a, yep. a growth company. Uh, and you and I imagine you have different structures as well, depending on the different strategic partners you bring on. Correct. Yeah. And we're very open to both. Very open to both. Um, we could we would love to actually work with um, uh, several cannabis manufacturers, either um, cannabis manufacturing grow facilities or cannabis growers um, and, and either one we would love to work with. Primarily the growers would be easier for us just so that we can prove the value of this system and partner with them early on um, so that we can use a prototype system within their infrastructure, monitor this data then provide our live data, retweak our designs and then replace that prototype unit with a production model unit um, without any cost at all to our, uh, to our partners. Also, we're searching for capital partners, to your point. Uh, we would love for um, a cannabis partner uh, to then come in and ask for, hey, we'll take an equity position or a licensing agreement uh, for X, Y, and Z number of systems at X, Y, and Z rates. Um, would you be able to, um, you know, to help substantiate a deal for us and then partner together and then grow together with you, which is our mantra. That's our mentality. 
uh, which we would absolutely be welcoming to. We want to um, grow with our community. So I, it, it's a little ironic that we're growing, you know, uh, within cannabis, we're growing in medical hemp spaces, but to truly grow on the capital front with our customers, our market, um, we're very much open to both on um, servicing the equipment within our technology to prove our economic value and environmental value, and also the capital partnership through um, through cannabis growers. It's this morning I was doing a workout and I heard uh, something that, that went like this, kind of like if you replace, um, you know, the uh, I or the W with I, so you know we and mm -hmm. I, uh, illness becomes wellness. And I'd never, I'd never heard that before. And I was thinking that's that's really applicable to this conversation because we're talking about cannabis, we're talking about you know growing, we're talking about healing, but we're also talking about we as a cannabis community. And so yeah. my question for you is how can how can the cannabis community truly help you as a we and not just be siloed in your company? Oh, love that by the way. I have never heard that before. Uh, yeah, transforming the uh, the eye into we to create wellness as opposed to this illness. Wow, um, I may use that a few times, Ben, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, by growing with us, the best way I can answer this is probably from what we just talked about on my my personal spiritual path to healing. We can grow together to create wellness for others. Hmm. Why couldn't we? If we are in a position to help a cannabis industry produce more with less pricing, uh, less cost and energy and water and CO2, et cetera. And we have the advantageous ability to help others across the world. It feels to me that we've created wellness together within that. I mean, that's what it feels to me. So that we are truly having a positive impact, not just on one individual, but a collective, a collective uh, group of anyone, everyone has some level of anxiety, has some level of depression, has some level of blood pressure irregularities or cardiovascular irregularities. And there has been absolute proven research over decades, if not centuries of work um, that prove and validate cannabis can help and alleviate X, Y, and Z illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, if, a, if a company, a grower, cannabis grower were to partner with us now I absolutely would love to turn that illness truly into a collective wellness by healing others. And what I would even, um, and I truly uh, believe this based off of all the data that we have is that we can also heal the earth. There's a wellness of the earth by more plants that are being grown. You know, you look at hemp um, uh, for an example, we can, we can grow a plant um, 13 feet high in a hundred days. Um, it, it, wild how how fast uh, we can have cultivation cycles of this medicinal plant and how much carbon we can sequester from just one plant um, using less cost of energy to produce it. Mm -hmm. um, so we can truly transform and heal the earth with an abundance more of oxygen transpiration while sequestering harmful carbon back into the soil. Um, and oh, and by the way, creating wellness with our cannabis growers to heal the collective community. To me, that's what everyone wins, including the earth. That's great. Everyone wins. Now, I've got a question here uh, from uh, Ray Walton, public or private company. So let's talk about kind of where you are and then let's talk about going forward, what your plans are in terms of, you know, answering the question, but then also an exit plan and what you may do with that as we've talked to add back to the cannabis community. Yeah, uh, so we're a private company now. Uh, we're a, a C Corp and uh, Utah based. Uh, and you know, in terms of our exit strategy, we are very, very open and flexible. And this is this fine line between being a uh, um, you know the, the stubborn entrepreneur that we have to do things no matter what must be this way versus the flexibility of let's look at the right exit path that benefits this space to create that wellness environment. Um, we are very much open to, um, you know, to an acquisition um, later on down the journey in our road so that we can increase more cannabis cultivation crops through a cannabis provider. Um, we're very much open to an IPO path. Um, if we would like to do an IPO either sooner than later, um, within an eight to 12 years. And in terms of our investments right now, uh, again, looking at our projections, our performer, our integrated business planning, um, uh, I'm not one to guarantee off of a subjective number, but I'm very much one to share confidence with what I have um, and being data driven, data proven, data informed. 
um, is that we're looking at anywhere between a, um, a seven to 12 percent return back to our shareholders for any investments being offered to the company. Um, now, of course, it takes partnership to do that. It takes years to do that. But in order for our exit path uh, to be achieved, we're very much open to working with the right capital provider. If we're looking for a, uh, I'll tell you this, if we're looking for a short term liquidity event uh, to shell the technology, we're not interested. We are looking for a, a buyer. We're looking for a partner and multiple partners that can prove this technology, let it see the light of day, be in this world and then start proving value across a myriad of cannabis cultivation cycles and industries. So if someone does want to learn more, let's say, uh, I assume you have Proforma, Prospectus, Pitch Deck, all that stuff. How would they get a hold of you? What's the best way? Yeah, they can visit us on our website at selu.earth, S-E-L-U dot E-A-R-T-H. Um, or they can email us as a group at contact at selu.earth. Um, they can personally email me if they would like. Anyone happy to have conversations and calls. I, I really enjoy learning more about space uh, myself. Uh, and also other capital creative solutions um, that we can tr achieve a true mutual partnership. So just email me directly at jake.hammock, J-A-K-E dot H-A-M-M-O-C-K at salu.earth. And happy to have conversations, happy to bring the group together um, so that we can truly prove uh, a very fruitful path to success. Oh, I think I lost your audio. Uh, just, I want to touch back just on one uh, last thing about the name. So you'd mentioned, you know, kind of an ethos and uh, the name and Native Americans. So I'd like to end with that to kind of sum yeah. up everything. Yeah. So Salu, um, and have to, I need to give credit where credit's due. My partner, uh, Missy Wesker, um, uh, founded the name. And does it fit just one to one with who we are? It is, it is, it is true joy as to as to embodying the ethos of the name. Selu is the grandmother of the corn and first woman of the earth in Cherokee mythology. Mm -hmm. So very similar in the Christian um, uh, theology to the Adam and Eve being Eve, Selu is the first woman of the earth. And in her story, um, there's multiple variations of her story um, that generally comes down to the interpretation of love within her children. Uh, there were two twins. Uh, one was actually uh, born from Selu and the other one uh, was found. He, this boy was discovered next to a, to a creek bed in the river. And why I love it so much is it actually occurred in the story in Tennessee. <laughs> uh, so in Appalachia, in the old Cherokee nation hmm. um, and uh, an Eastern band of Cherokees now. Um, and Selu had the gift of creating corn and creating food to replenish the world. Her children grew jealous of this power, this gift uh, that she had, and they wanted it for themselves. Um, and she knew that her children, would unfortunately, would take her life. And so she told her children, I know you're going to take my life, and it's perfectly okay to maintain balance within all things. But when you do, bury me out here. Bury me out here. And there's a certain practice and tradition I'd like you to do with corn, not to pick, uh, plant it at a certain time, pick it at a certain time, et cetera. Um, and if you do that, you will feed the earth. Mm. And that is exactly what our ethos is to do, is to feed, cultivate, and take care of the earth. Um, so our ethos in Selu embodies that of Selu's spirit, so that we become one uh, with all things throughout the earth to provide back. And again, just to wrap it up in our ethos now, which I would love to turn and transform this illness into a collective wellness. <laughs> wow, that's great. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd love... Uh... Love everything that you had to say, and I'm sure we'll have more conversations. I apologize, my camera keeps going out, but I do appreciate you being on here, Jake. And if any of you viewers or listeners, you have more questions, reach out to him. And uh, good luck with things coming up. I, I know you're going to have a great future here with this product, and I look forward to speaking with you soon. Perfect. And thanks so much, Ben, for having me. I appreciate the conversation today, and take care. All right. Thanks. Talk to you soon. See ya.